You live, Catherine? Okay. Hello, and welcome to the sixth the sixth Fetty Fight Night, um, brought to you by the Federalist Society Student Division and the Federalist Society Chapter at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law. Tonight, we will be examining the fiery romance between libertarian and conservative ideologies. My name is Catherine Urbanic, and I am president of the Pepperdine Caruso Federalist Society Chapter. I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce our fighters and distinguished mediator. Uh, first in our conservative corner is Nathan Schleter. Nathan Schleter is professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College, where he directs the pre-law program and also teaches courses in social and political philosophy, ethical theory, and philosophy and literature. He is the recipient of Hillsdale College's Doherty Award for Teaching Excellence. Nathan has a BA in history from Miami, Miami University of Ohio and an MA and PhD in politics from the University of Dallas. He is the author of One Dream or Two, Justice in America and the Thought of Martin Luther King Jr. and The Humane, Version, the Humane Vision of Wendell Berry, edited with Mark Mitchell. His articles have appeared in First Things, Touchstone, Logos, Communio, Public Discourse, and Perspectives in Political Science. Nathan has been a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities and Princeton University. He is currently working on his next book, Playing with Fire, The Peril and Promise of the Utopian Imagination. He and his wife, Elizabeth, who is a homemaker and homeschooler, have nine children. In our libertarian corner, we have Nikolai Wenzel. Nikolai Wenzel is Distinguished Professor of Economics at Fayetteville State University, where he holds the L.V. Hackley Chair for the Study of Capitalism and Free Enterprise. He previously taught at Hillsdale College, where he was elected Professor of the Year by the class of 2010. Nikolai has a BSFS cum laude from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and a PhD in economics from George Mason University. He is the author of more than 50 academic articles and book chapters. He writes primarily in constitutional political economy, institutional analysis, and, and Austrian economics. Nikolai is a fellow of the Molinari Institute in Paris, France, and a member of the Mont Perlin, Pel, I'm sorry, Mont Pelerin Society. He was a research fellow at the University of Paris Center for Law and Economics from 2008 until the center closed in 2019. And finally, our distinguished mediator is the Honorable Elizabeth Branch. She is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. In March of 2018, Judge Elizabeth L. Branch was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Judge Branch graduated from Davidson College and Emory University School of Law. She served as a federal law clerk to the Honorable J. Owen Forrester of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. Following her clerkship, Judge Branch joined the litigation department of Smith, Gambrell, and Russell LLP in Atlanta, where she was first an associate and then a partner. From 2004 to 2008, Judge Branch was a senior official in the administration of President George W. Bush in Washington, D.C. She served first as the Associate General Counsel for Rules and Legislation at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and then as the counselor to the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. She returned to Smith Gambrel in 2008 as a litigation partner. In September of 2012, Judge Branch was appointed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia, where she served until March of 2018. Judge Branch is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Atlanta Lawyers Chapter for the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. And with that, I will hand it over to our distinguished guests. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, good evening to all of y'all. And uh, so glad to be here this evening with my distinguished panelists. And, and welcome to Fetty Night Fights. Our event tonight, as Catherine noted, is a nod to Valentine's Day and is titled, I Love You, You're Perfect Now. Insulin for the Times Trouble relationship between conservatives and libertarians. I am joined by Professor Schleter, serving as the advocate for conservatives, and Professor Wenzel, the advocate for libertarians. They are seeking a lasting reconciliation between their clients, and in fact, they have written a book dedicated to this debate and their hopes of unification. And I have this book, although you may not be able to see it. There we go. I got mine from Hillsdale College. Um, Selfish Libertarians and Socialist Conservatives, the Foundation of the Libertarian Conservative Debate. Just so that you know, as the audience, that the mediation is gonna be divided into two parts. The first part 
I will pose four big picture questions to Professor Schleter and Professor Wenzel to better understand their client's relationship. After that, I will turn it over to the audience for questions. One note, um, when it comes time for audience questions, uh, the focus of tonight's mediation will be on matters of public philosophy, law, and public policy. We will not be discussing partisan political subjects. And now, before I turn to the, the four big topics, I will let each advocate introduce his client briefly. Uh, Professor Schleter. So uh, my client is conservative. You said briefly, so this is not my uh, background. My, my client is conservatism. Right. Uh, and he's the senior member, I think, of this uh, relationship. My client Professor is Winslow. libertarian. Oh, thank you. My client is libertarianism, and my client has benefited immensely from the wisdom of conservatism, except when conservatism starts trying to dictate things and things get out of hand. All right, and with that, we will now turn to the first big question. We're gonna be looking at the history of this relationship. And the first question I would like to ask the estranged couple, your clients, is what is your understanding of the history of the relationship? Uh, and if you would, please also tell us how you are defining conservatism and libertarianism. And Professor Schleter, I'll start with you. Okay, first I wanna say thank you to uh, Peter Redpath at Federalist Society, to Catherine Urbanic, uh, Pepperdine Law, uh, the chapter there, and obviously our, our mediator, uh, the Honorable Elizabeth Branch for taking on this task. And uh, I also uh, want, on behalf of my client, conservatism, uh, who has uh, urged me to speak in his name this evening, I offer a paternal greeting to my long estranged son, libertarianism. Uh, notice I did not say paternalistic greeting. Uh, and uh, you heard this right. Uh, this is a love story. Uh, but as I understand it, it's not a romance. Uh, it's in fact a family fight. Uh, this is uh, really the story of the prodigal son. And in this story, conservatism is the father and libertarianism is the wayward son who lit out on his own and squandered his inheritance. And so tonight I'm calling you home, son. By conservatism, uh, I, conservatism means to conserve something. And what conservatism seeks to conserve is that form of classical liberalism, which was expressed in the principles of the American founding. Those principles are a distillation of the best elements of the classical, medieval, and modern English tradition of political thought and experience. I'm gonna quote Thomas Jefferson in a letter on the sources of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Jefferson wrote, all American Whigs fought alike on these subjects. Not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject. Neither aiming at originality, a principle nor sentiment, it was intended to be an expression of the American mind and to give that expression a proper tone and spirit for the occasion. All of its authority rests on the harmonizing sentiments of the day. And Jefferson mentions the public books of Wright, Aristotle, Cicero, Locke, Sidney, etc. So this is this great tradition of thought, not just one thinker. That's conservatism. That's the classical liberalism of the American founding. I would argue that 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 tradition of classical liberalism is what I call an equilibrium of liberty. What I mean by that is that it holds uh, tradition, liberty, and reason in a kind of family of equilibrium. When they're with one another, they perfect one another. They keep one another whole and complete. But when they become separated, they become distorted and perverse. So reason without tradition becomes rationalism or tradition without reason becomes tribalism or liberty without reason and tradition becomes libertarianism. The thing is that liberty is not the only good or even the highest good that people want. What libertarianism does is it wrenches liberty out of that equilibrium and makes it the only and the highest good. It treats our grown institutions like scaffolding that can just be kicked away now that 
they've served their purpose and now we can have a libertarian paradise. And I don't think it works that way. So it's important to see uh, how radical the implications are of libertarianism. What is libertarianism? Uh, Dr. Wenzel is going to clarify that on behalf of his client, but it basically means that government is limited exclusively to the prevention of coercion. Uh, it, it means minarchy. And what I want to say is, A, number one, this view is hostile to the American regime. None of the American founders thought this way. Number two, such a regime has never existed in our history before, in, in world history. Third, even libertarian thinkers like Friedrich Hayek deny that this is an, a, a good or possible form of regime. And finally, it's a, it, it entails a contradiction in itself because if libertarianism allows for a monopoly on coercion, then it's gonna be using coercion to keep other people from using their coercive powers. And if you're gonna allow for a monopoly over coercion, why not other kinds of monopolies? So in conclusion, I want to say that libertarians are at the scraps of classical liberalism. And I ask them to come home to the feast uh, and we will take care of that uh, stubborn and resentful older brother, traditionalist conservatism, who is now also threatening to leave the family. We need to get the family back together. Thank you, Professor Wenzel. Thank you very much, Judge Branch. Thank you, Dr. Schleter, and thanks to the Federalist Society, and especially thanks for all of you. I never imagined that uh, anybody would want to listen to political philosophy on a Friday night um, over Valentine's Day weekend. As you might imagine, I have a fundamentally different understanding of this relationship. It's more of a relationship of old friends going back centuries or even millennia, and it's a tense relationship that goes back and forth. And rather than the prodigal son analogy, I think of two friends in a partnership and conservatism sometimes is the wise counselor and sometimes it is the imposer who tries to impose things and tell everybody else what to do and conservatism is magnificent when it's a counselor and troublesome when it is an imposer so we could focus on many things we could focus on history i we can talk about the american founding but there are good things in the American founding and there are some elements that are antithetical to freedom in the American founding. So it's not just the American founding that we're trying to conserve, but the good in the American founding. And that tradition for which I'm advocating tonight on behalf of my client is modern libertarianism, which comes down to a rejection of the initiation of violence. This means fundamentally a night watchman state, a state that handles the police, the military and courts and stops there so as not to suffocate a vibrant civil society. And I'm gonna talk a lot about the vibrancy of civil society and its importance. And the third element of libertarianism, of course, is free markets so people can cooperate and work together and work for each other and thrive. So my opponent's client mentioned a few things about classical liberalism and certainly classical liberalism is important. It started with a presumption of liberty, first against the monarchy and first against tradition, unrooted in reason, excesses of power, and then classical liberalism turned to the excesses of socialism. And in that, there was a rejection of both excessive tradition and excessive reason. Reason divorced from uh, tradition is merely social engineering and hubris, but tradition alone can lead to what economists will call path dependence and difficulties if it's not checked and thought about. So why libertarianism versus classical liberalism? Classical liberalism certainly was a wonderful idea and it was a great start. But I think in many ways we can say that the American experiment has failed. It started from very noble principles, but if we look at the constitutional scene today, the federal government controls directly about 30% of the economy with another 10% controlled indirectly by regulation. Article one, section eight and the 10th and 9th amendments are in many circles quaint notions that are completely abandoned. Classical liberalism with its notion that it could correct market failures and could correct some social failures while still, being rec uh, while still recognizing the spirit of liberty, classical liberalism did not go far enough because it went too far. It did not go far enough in preserving liberty and we need better safeguards and principles. So why are we here tonight? We're here tonight because liberty requires self-governance. 
Liberty requires virtue. We can't start talking about virtue ethics because that would take us five hours. But I will start simply with the notion that capitalism at its core is based on an ethic of savings rather than an ethic of consumption as it has become. Libertarians can remind, I mean, conservatives can remind us that it is fundamentally about that ethic. And if it's an ethic of savings, it also means an ethic of temperance and an ethic of prudence and an ethic of planning and an ethic of self-governance and taking care of one's own and taking care of civil society and practicing virtue. So if all those things are important, why can't we rely on conservatism? Reasons briefly. First, conservatism is arbitrary. There are many strains of conservatism, and I'll come back to this. Second, conservatism is often hubristic. It knows what is best for everybody. And instead of looking on a century or so of failed American social engineering and saying that social engineering is the problem, conservatism wants the right kind of social engineering with the right social engineers. And finally, conservatism in its attempts to impose the virtues that are necessary for liberty is often itself offensive to liberty as it quashes liberty in order to preserve liberty. In sum, libertarianism takes the best of conservatism. It's not kicking out the scaffolding, it is preserving liberty. And since my opponent here went biblical, I'm going to respond with 2 Samuel 2, 7, 12, 7. Thou art the man, as the prophet Nathan, not coincidentally said, and certainly I'm not accusing my client, uh, my opponent of this, but conservatism itself is the one that is trying to preserve liberty, but in the process, destroying liberty. Uh, thank you both. You've um, highlighted the strengths uh, of both of your clients, but could you tell us a little bit about the weaknesses uh, that you each have and what your greatest uh, failures have been? And I'll let you take it in whatever order you'd like. I'll start with that. And I want to start with my thanks for Dr. Schleter for proposing this question. Um, we met about 15 years ago and started debating these ideas and we disagreed, but we listened to each other. And I think ours can be a model of uh, civic disagreement. Uh, in fact, Dr. Schleter has found himself reading a lot of Hayek and Buchanan of late. And I found myself reading the great Bill Buckley and Leo Strauss. So this is what uh, intellectual discourse is all about. So yes, I can see three weaknesses in libertarianism, which I fully admit on behalf of my clients. The first one is libertarianism has a tendency to step away from civic engagement and politics. This notion, leave me alone. So somehow politics will take care of itself. And I think it's important for libertarians to realize that politics does not take care of itself. Since I'm an economist, I can use an analogy from markets. Markets Markets require freedom and the rule of law. This is where uh, judges and the Federalist Society comes in. But markets also require entrepreneurs to drive the process within that framework. And I think the same applies for politics. The second one is I think libertarians often have a tendency to ignore the importance of virtue and specifically intrapersonal virtue. Libertarians are very, very big on interpersonal virtue, the way we treat each other, but sometimes forget that we need to cultivate those virtues that are required for self-government. And then finally, yes, there is a tendency among libertarians to be naive. We leave other people alone, so why wouldn't they leave us alone? And in fact, there are many people out there who would try to impose, uh, impose their vision upon us. And I think libertarians need to realize that just because they step away and because libertarianism does not impose things on others, that that doesn't mean that others won't do the opposite. Okay, I want to second what my uh, client uh, Nikolai said there. Uh, we were talking about this uh, uh, recently and uh, we both uh, were amused by the fact that since we wrote our book, it was published in what, 2015, we, we had taught a couple of classes at Hillsdale on this debate. Uh, I've become much more uh, sympathetic to libertarianism and he's moved closer to conservatism. So uh, maybe there's hope in this relationship. I wanna identify what I think are two problems, at least in contemporary conservatism. Uh, the first one has to do with morality and politics. And the second has to do with uh, markets and our attitudes towards the free market. Uh, so the first one is that I think conservatism needs to come to terms with a fact of political pluralism. That is, given the best we know of human nature, 
if people are given the freedom to pursue the truth as they see it, they're going to arrive at different conceptions of what is right and good. I take that as a fact. Uh, maybe it's an unfortunate fact. I think it's an unfortunate fact. It, it's a sign of the limits, uh, epistemic limits, our ability to know fully what is true and good. But the fact is a free society is going to be a diverse society. And so you're going to have a very difficult time if you want to organize the entire political society according to one conception of what is right and good. Uh, you can either eliminate freedom and try and do that, or you're going to have freedom and you're going to have to come up with some way to have a decent coexistence. And I'm not saying here that uh, conservatism means that government has to be neutral or that we within civil society certainly do not have to be neutral with respect to these competing conceptions of what's right or good. But I do think that, I think that's impossible. I don't think government can ever be fully neutral with respect to uh, right and wrong. But I do think that we can lower our expectations a little bit about perfect justice and perfect goodness. Um, so Nikolai, when we, uh, I'm sorry, my, my uh, uh, adversary here um, would sometimes uh, observe in class that if, uh, well, it was a, he, he was complimenting me, he clearly didn't know me very well, but he would say if, if Dr. Schleter was the morality czar, I'd be maybe a little bit okay with it. But how do I know that the morality czar is going to be Dr. Schleter? It could be someone else. How do you know it won't be someone that uh, is hostile to those sorts of views? And uh, now we're actually seeing that to some degree come to fruition. Um, uh, conservatives, it seems conservatism is under incredible attack right now by, uh, by woke ideology and identity politics and cancel culture. And so we're seeing what I think is a new Puritanism that's really frightening. And so we should be warned by that about trying to over moralize both the market and politics. Uh, second issue is just a free market, uh, attitudes towards the free market. And I, I think conservatives are too prone to uh, making critici unfair criticisms of the market, uh, giving caricature depictions of the market homo economicus, it promotes egoism and selfishness and individualism, it's predicated upon all of these things. And I don't think that's an accurate depiction. It's certainly not an accurate depiction of how the market uh, necessarily works or usually works. I do think there is a problem with corporate capitalism that we're seeing right now. Uh, and it's a real problem. I don't have, I think it's worth having a conversation over uh, the, the structure of corporate capitalism, what it does to incentives, uh, especially when you have um, the, the kind of monopoly over social media that we're seeing today. I think that's a real issue, but capitalism and the free market are not the same thing. And it seems to me that, the, that there's, there can be a defense of the free market on solid anthropological grounds. And those were the most solid defenses that you find in classical liberalism. Uh, and just to add to that, I think with the, with the conservative criticism, the market is often, I think, a naive view about government failure, uh, a sort of not really acknowledging that, okay, even if the market is not, uh, I mean, every classical liberal knew the market wasn't perfect, but if what's your remedy going to be? Uh, if human beings don't change when they go into government, this is a classic uh, public choice argument. If, if people don't change when they go into government, what makes you think government is not going to be subject to the same kinds of failures that the market is uh, subject to. So I think that conservatism needs to be a little, become a little more um, friendly to the market and a little more skeptical about morality and politics. Those would be my two criticisms. What do you think your client's greatest successes have been? Professor Wenzel? I'll start with that. I think one of my clients' great successes stemming from the classical liberal tradition uh, has been pushing back against unfettered tradition and unfettered reason. And if we look at unfettered tradition, we have the difficulties that come from a static system that doesn't respect individual rights. And if we look at unfettered reason, we have the French Revolution and the Soviet Revolution. And my client has been very good at that. 
My client has been very good also at infusing uh, the American spirit through the Declaration of Independence and many elements of the Constitution with a spirit of liberty. And of course, the constitutional system wasn't perfect. It was a safeguard and has been a safeguard in many ways against encroachments of government against liberty, but it also had its, had its weaknesses. But I think there's still a spirit of liberty that lives on in the US. This is a hard question for me. Um, I think the greatest success of conservatism, uh, frankly, is instituting this nation, found, founding America, on these principles that they distilled from the tradition and giving us a country that uh, for all its flaws, I feel incredibly blessed to be in. Uh, I feel incredible gratitude for that. And conservatism, if it means anything, it means trying to keep that attitude of gratitude alive and to keep those institutions alive and to defend them and protect them. And that's a long game. Um, I don't see any, uh, I, I think it's not a conservative view to ever look for one single uh, um, event or a single leader that is going to lead us into the promised land. It's anti-revolutionary in some sense uh, at its heart. And so it doesn't look for um, you know, the, the one success. I think we, we have a kind of moderated set of expectations about what those achievements are. So I look around and I see, uh, you know, the various think tanks. Uh, I see the initiatives of various uh, groups, thinkers, writers, keeping that tradition and conversation alive uh, right now. So um, that would be my answer on that. All right. Um how would you describe your client's relationship with the government? Uh, Professor Sleater, you certainly talked about the role of conservatism at the nation's founding, but, but how would you expand on that? Yeah, great question. So government today, I would call it a very fraught, suspicious, hostile relationship. I think conservatives see, especially government at the federal level as massively overgrown, uh, the greatest threat to conservatism uh, I think right now is the fourth branch, the administrative state in its expansion, it, it, uh, it's unconstitutional, it is lawless. And, um, and so no conservative could have a fondness for the administrative state. Um, for government generally, uh, conservatism uh, is guardedly friendly. Conservatism regards government as a natural grown institution. It's not something we just make, it's something we're born into. It's something that meets an exigency or necessity in our nature. And so we have to have a kind of piety towards government, the government we've been given, the government uh, that we've inherited. We have to have a, a kind of piety for it. And I don't mean uncritical uh, devotion to it, but a kind of piety for it, uh, while vigilance that we keep it within its proper boundaries. And so you know, con conservatives point out that uh, government does more than just prevent coercion. Government seems to serve lots of other purposes uh, that involve, if you put in the terms of economics, if we had to do that, uh, lots of market failures, what James Buchanan called the cost of social inter interdependence, um, the, the externalities, positive and negative externalities that, re, that, that really create an occasion for our needing government to provide conditions that can help us flourish. Professor Wenzel. Well, I think in many ways we agree on this in terms of our worry about uh, the growth of the state and especially the, the administrative state, which I think is unconstitutional and undemocratic and especially because I'm an economist, I have to say it probably also has regressive effects. Um, and we see that with the growth of government and the growth of regulation. But libertarianism, my client, does not share the piety or what I would call actually the naivete about government uh, that conservatism has. Government is at best a necessary evil. It is a powerful tool that is to be bound and watched constantly with eternal vigilance. 
Uh, I think it was Madison, although there are better historians, I'm sure, in this audience who wrote something to the effect of, let us hear no more of men as angels, but bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. And far too often, even if government may be necessary to protect rights, government is power. It is a tool that can be used to impose private preferences through public means, uh, often under the guise of the common good often under the guise of an alleged market failure, which may simply be an instance where I don't like the outcome of the market, so I'm gonna lobby to have a different outcome. So uh, libertarianism takes the good of conservatism and its worry about concentrated and unchecked power, but takes it one step beyond that without the piety, seeing government as something potentially dangerous, a potentially dangerous, it is a force to be reckoned with, and it is forced to be contained and worried about constantly. Thank you, and, and both of you have talked about this a little bit, but maybe you could give us a more comprehensive list of who are your clients' most influential thinkers. Well, I've just meant, I mentioned some of mine uh, when I recited uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, letter. He mentions uh, Aristotle, Cicero, Sidney Locke, etc. And uh, I love the etc. I asked my students, what's in the etc? Uh, what would we add there? I think we'd have to add, I would have to add Thomas Aquinas um, and uh, English common law and Edmund Burke and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and George Washington. And I'm going to throw uh, Friedrich Hayek and William Buckley into that list too. Professor Wenzel. Well, with a notable exception of Alexander Hamilton, many of the American founders are foundational as are the, um, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers. I think especially of Locke and Burke is an interesting one because I think conservatism, conservatism reveres Burke, uh, whereas uh, libertarianism takes great lessons from him and has great respect for him. F.A. Hayek is also a tricky one because he is a foundational for classical liberalism, but in many ways uh, one could consider that he didn't go far enough. Uh, Ludwig von Mises in the Austrian tradition and Murray Rothbard also in the Austrian tradition. And I would be remiss not to um, share the name of one of my favorite thinkers, the French economist Frédéric Bastiat in the early 19th century. Great, um, thank you. Uh, let's, let's move on to our second topic, which is fault. Uh, and I will have both of you start by talking about whether you think your client has been at fault in any way in the contentious aspect of this relationship. So I, th I think the, um, the faults uh, stand the same as I mentioned, the tendency to step away from civic engagement and the importance of virtue. Um, so if I may segue from there into the greatest challenges, I think the problem that we have here is that liberty needs virtue and tradition, but it needs tradition tempered by reason and tradition respectful of rights. Uh, and that is where the challenges come in. We have much to learn from conservatism, but I wanna expand a little bit on the three short points that I made earlier about the three challenges of conservatism. The first one is conservatism is arbitrary. I've been thinking about this for 20 years. I'm really still not sure what conservatism is. We have the very reasonable and very appealing natural law liberalism proposed by uh, Professor Schleter on behalf of his client, but there are also paleocons and neocons and Wendell Berry crunchy cons and conservative Catholics with whom I can share a drink after this uh, debate because wherever you find four Catholics, you'll find a fifth. But there are also some conservative Protestants who would deny me the right to have a drink after this, or at least not during certain hours and in the past uh, completely illegally. Even in the American founding, there are tensions between the spirit of 1776 and the spirit of 1787. There are tensions within the US Constitution. So it's tough to know really what is being conserved and why. And this comes back to my client's worry that conservatism often serves as an arbitrary excuse to impose private preferences through public means uh, because there are some good things in conservatism, in some conservatisms. There are some scary things in other forms of conservatism. And it's unclear whether conservatism fundamentally is about principle or power. The second problem that we see with conservatism 
is that conservatism for even in my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Schleter's uh, vision of it all, there is still an element of hubris and naivete. We can look at, for example, the war on poverty in the US or the war on drugs, which have been utter failures. Social engineering has been a failure. And there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of ink and economics that have been spilled from the Austrian tradition and the public choice tradition explaining why social engineering doesn't work. In spite of all that and the preponderance of the facts from history, conservatism seems to want better social engineering with the right people in place. And that's why I mentioned in class uh, some years ago that I might very well be comfortable with a secretary of virtue leader, but I would be terrified at the thought that we would be granting that power to the federal government because somebody else, far more scary, could be stepping into that. I also have looked a few times, even though I'm not a lawyer, I like to read the constitution occasionally. I have not seen the position of secretary of virtue anywhere in article one, section eight, or in any of the other enumerated powers of the federal government. Conservatism often has a tendency to claim to have a secret special avenue to human experience, human wisdom, and natural law. Now, natural law certainly is tempting when we are facing the executioner or the torturer or the tax collector, but we also have to understand that the understanding of natural law has changed over the years and that it's not rigid and that there were awful things done in the name of natural law. So libertarianism, as opposed to conservatism, is much more aware of the failures of, human, um, of, of humanity, much more aware of the fallen nature of humans, much more aware of the importance of prudence and marginal tinkering. Now, conservatism certainly has one foot in prudence and one foot in careful tinkering while respect, respecting tradition, but conservatism has another foot vigorously advancing its vision through legislation and through coercion. And finally, conservatism in its quest to, to bolster the very foundations of a free society often has a tendency to forget about the very freedom that it is trying to defend. This is the old adage about having to burn the village to save the village. Libertarian um, conservatives, even if I think at least in the brand of Professor Schleter, really want to advance virtue, not for the sake of virtue, but for the sake of the good society, for the sake of liberty, for the sake of the common good, have a tendency to forget about individual rights, to forget about individual choices, to forget about the open society in which we can have debates and do different things and live different lifestyles as long as we don't harm other people. And finally, under this category, conservatism has a tendency to asphyxiate civil society with its regulations and its virtue legislation. I'd like to close this section by paraphrasing a magnificent phrasing that I picked up last week from Stephanie Slade at Reason, who wrote about in different language, the different spheres in which we operate. So we all operate in markets, in civil society, and in um, the limited realm of government. Many strains of conservatism have a tendency to uh, accuse libertarianism of being a bunch of people in their own corner, rebuilding society in their own minds while smoking illegal substances. But this is where I take the language from uh, Stephanie Slade, where I say that libertarianism is based on an ethic of the mirror the kitchen table and the front porch. So why would we use that, the mirror, the kitchen table and the front porch? Yes, it all starts with the mirror, looking at oneself, examining oneself. The libertarians that I know think all the time about how they can perfect themselves, how they can be better citizens, how they can act to be good examples of uh, libertarianism and how to work more effectively, how to be better stewards of their families, better actors in their corner of civil society, better at the markets in which they serve. But the mirror is not the only thing, it's just the beginning. The next part is the kitchen table. The kitchen table where we have conversations with family, conversations with friends, where we serve each other and help each other on a voluntary basis. And then we take that spirit out to the front porch. The front porch is the beginning of civil society. It's the beginning of conversation with people who are different sharing ideas with them. It's the beginning of the conversation with neighbors who might need a helping hand and forming civic associations in the traditions of Tocqueville. And then from the front porch into the clubs and churches and universities. And my worry 
in all of this on behalf of my client is that in its attempt to advance virtue, conservatism would have an agent of the state sitting on the front porch, telling us what we can and cannot do and pushing us in a certain direction. An agent of the state at the kitchen table, defining the kinds of peaceful voluntary relationships that we can have and perish the thought, an agent of the state next to us at the mirror, telling us which way we ought to be cultivating our own virtue. So my client, I'm, I'm sure is in tears right now. He, he, he believes that his, his wayward son never knew him and perhaps he never made himself sufficiently known. Uh, many of what, many of the things that uh, were said there do not reflect any conservatism uh, that we are defending this evening. Uh, it is true that conservatism is made up of differences. I mentioned the equilibrium of liberty, equality, I'm sorry, liberty, tradition, and reason. Um, but conservatism sees that none, no one of those has a purchase on the absolute truth. Uh, it sees conservatism as a tradition of inquiry in which there are lots of arguments that still happen. Uh, none of us, no conservative thinks that they have the final answer, like one fixed rule, no coercion ever. Um, uh, they think that reality is too complex to be resolved into a simple, uniform rule of that nature. In fact, uh, social conservatism regards libertarianism as reflecting the exact same kind of social engineering that, that the libertarians are accusing conservatives of. Uh, I'm gonna quote Friedrich Hayek here. Um, Friedrich Hayek says, nor Locke, nor Hume, nor Smith, nor Burke, whoa, that's big names, could have ever argued that every law is an evil, for every law is an infraction of liberty. Their argument was never a complete laissez-faire argument, which as the very words show, is part of the French rationalist tradition. And in its literal sense was never defended by any of the English classical economists. Their argument was never anti-state as such, or anarchistic, which is a logical outcome of the rationalist, laissez-faire doctrine. So it's libertarianism, ironically, that, that comes from the same rationalist tradition that communism does. It takes an abstract universal principle and it will use it to sort of wreck and dissolve all the grown institutions, especially the political institutions that we have inherited for our flourishing. And we've already seen that lever working in the 20th century uh, through, for example, uh, court decisions that have uh, virtually eliminated uh, the protections on obscene speech and caused a proliferation of pornography or the, the move towards no-fault divorce, which has contributed to the dis dissolution of the family. Um, so, uh, so conservatism doesn't recognize what libertarianism is describing. Uh, one further point here is that um, uh, Conservatives never advocated the national government uh, promoting morality. They fully agree with that. But one of the grown political institutions in the state governments is a power that was there from the colonial period through the, through the uh, revolutionary period into the constitutional period to this very day. Uh, governments have the power to provide for the health, safety, welfare, and yes, morals of their citizens. And that is in those cases when those private actions are nuisances when they harm the physical or moral ecology of a, of a place, they're, they're subject rightly to regulation. Now, let me just say three things that I think uh, briefly are challenges in this relationship. Number one, libertarianism just has a, a flawed anthropology. It begins where human beings hopefully end. That is, at the beginning, none of us is some independent rational thinker who's consenting to authority. At the beginning, all of us are extremely vulnerable and dependent, and we require unconditional affection, care, attention, education, discipline, yes, coercion. My parents coerced, I don't know about yours, for our own good, in order to become the independent reasoners, hopefully at the end of that process, who can responsibly consent. So the family and the political association are not are not institutions we create like some, like we're fully sprung from the head of Zeus. 
mature and reasonable with full consent. Uh, we grow out of those institutions and we need them. And so, as I said, we can't just kick them down and have a, a free society independent of them. And, um, and what libertarianism does is it promotes a kind of individualism against those natural institutions that really acts like a solvent. What it does is it, it presses against civil society and tends to dissolve some of the, um, so some of the intermediary institutions that serve as the greatest bulwark against government uh, encroachment. Uh, the, what libertarianism has done in many ways is promoted mass society, which every totalitarian Aristotle, that's the, that's the advice he gives for, for despots. What they wanna do is dissolve all the intermediary institutions and make us a mass of individuals. That's when their power is maximized. That was what Tocqueville warned about. Secondly, quickly, utop uh, utopianism. Uh, political associations can't be understood according to economic analysis. Uh, you're, you're not gonna understand it as free individuals consenting to it. None of us consented to the families we are in. Politics and families are messy and we've got to work our way through them and not try to replace them with engineered uh, institutions that are divorced from all tradition. And finally, I think that there's a tendency towards massive imprudence on the part of libertarians. I quote Hayek here one more time and I'll conclude with it. Hayek writes, our attitude ought to be similar to that of a physician toward a living organism. Like him, we have to deal with a self-maintaining whole, which is kept going by forces we cannot replace and which we must therefore use in all we try to achieve. What can be done is to improve it. What must, uh, it must be done by working with those forces rather than against them. In all our endeavored improvement, we must always work inside the whole, aim at piecemeal rather than total construction and use at each stage of the his stage the historical material at hand. So that's incrementalism, yes, it's not sexy, it's not dramatic, but that's where you're gonna make the difference, not imagining some world of uh, libertarian utopia that's never existed and never will. Uh, thank you. Uh, which of you has had the upper hand in this relationship? <laughs> Professor Wenzel? I think it's pretty clear that conservatism has. It is so much easier to impose and to push in a certain direction than it is constantly to fight for one's rights. So my client has tried over the years, but conservatism certainly has had the upper hand. Do you agree, uh, Professor Schleter? Um, uh, I would say that conservatism has had a much greater impact generally uh, over political decisions for the reasons that have been given, conservatives are willing to engage in government incrementally to try and make it more conducive to human flourishing. Um, and I would also say that conservatism is, um, uh, is more closely allied with the kinds of humane concerns that also set limits to government. And I, I can't make you know, an absolute statement on this, but I think that you know, it's a basic conservative position that the most important thing to know about politics is that politics is not the most important thing. That conservatives on the whole are much more friendly to transcendence, to the insights of literature, of philosophy, of poetry, of, uh, I think they're much, more likely inclined, I could be wrong, but I think this is probably true, to be members of churches and other uh, intermediary, inst in intermediary institutions. So I do think that conservatism has uh, probably had a greater influence in the wider culture and in politics, but I want to insist that I don't think c conservatism can't do this without the libertarians. It's wounded without the libertarians. It's limping without the, the sort of things that libertarianism can bring. And so um, it's not been as nearly as effective uh, as it should be or could be uh, if there was a more unified uh, uh, classical liberalism that we could get behind. 
Well, and uh, Professor Schleter, let me play off of what you just said about that conservatives need libertarians. Um, let me start with uh, Professor Wenzel. Which of you has been better at compromising? Oh, that's a tricky question because the very purpose for this debate and the very reason that we've turned to mediation is for us to compromise and to find common ground. But one does not easily compromise with losses of liberty. So we're, libertarianism, my client, finds itself in a very difficult position. And I think uh, the position of libertarianism is we're always ready to listen. We're always ready to learn, but please don't impose. And that I think has been the limits of uh, compromise. And I think conservatism has been much more willing to compromise because conservatism, for better or for worse, I've already admitted the faults of my client, conservatism is much more comfortable working in the domain of politics. So conservatism at times may have made concessions to libertarianism. It also may have made uh, concessions to the growth of the state and perhaps even to other uh, veins of intellectual traditions like progressivism or even perhaps socialism in its attempt to engage in the messiness of politics. So on that front, I would say conservatism definitely has been better at compromising for better or for worse. Leader. Yeah, that's generous. Uh, it's, a, it's a generous uh, reply, and I think it's uh, largely true. Uh, there are some areas where uh, conservatives, I think, uh, have been and are more uncompromising. Uh, I, I would back up and just make an observation that I have not stated yet, um, but it's been implied in everything that I've been saying, and that is that uh, conservatives and libertarians agree that any uh, uh, free, good, flourishing society is going to have a really robust civil society. And I think conservatives would agree that, that that's where the work, you know, the work is done. And so insofar as libertarians are advocating ways to you know, promote that more initiatives within civil society, conservatives are very much in favor of that. And there's no need to even compromise. We're in agreement with that. But I do think that especially uh, where I have seen uh, the largest uh, schism in say the last 20 years between uh, libertarians and conservatives um, is uh, principally with respect to how we think about marriage and the family. I think that's probably been um, one over which conservatives are not really willing to compromise. And that's a conversation we can have uh, in a little bit or during Q&A. Uh, thank you both. Um, let me, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of our time and I wanna make sure that we have time for audience questions. And so let's move on to the third topic um, and, and the challenges. Uh, what in your client's views are the greatest challenges in this relationship? Uh, let's start with Professor Wenzel. So um, if we want to jump, I would say the, the challenge is really, as I've mentioned, um, the difficulties with uh, conservatism and we've outlined some of those challenges. So if I may, in the sake of time, I think it may be um, good to work towards the concept of reconciliation flowing from those challenges. And um, the question then I think becomes, in light of all those challenges, is reconciliation desirable and is it possible? And I think those are the questions we have to ask and the challenges are there. The challenges exist, there is absolutely no doubt about it. And reconciliation is desirable, liberty needs it. Um, I see on behalf of my uh, client, that perhaps the two greatest threats facing the Republic right now are number one, the growth in government and the administrative state, and number two, cancel culture, postmodernism, cultural Marxism, as one may be inclined to call it. And I think right there, it would be a pity if these old friends, these old partners who have walked the miles and the decades and the millennia together were to go off in separate directions and not face these threats together. 
I've already admitted some of my clients' faults. I think conservatism ought to remember liberty, civil society, and the market process. And we do have a disagreement on civil society, which I'll talk about in a very brief moment. Conservatism would do well to remember the unintended consequences. Advocate uh, Schleter has pointed out the importance of the common law and emergence and caution. My client wholeheartedly agrees with that, but then my client is surprised when conservatism starts advocating for marriage legislation and changing from the top down certain evolutions that have happened in the understanding of marriage as a free contract between or among consenting adults. Uh, the then question then is, what is reconciliation possible? And I think conservatives are great when they advise and dangerous when they impose. I would say to my conservative friends in the spirit of Hayek and in the spirit of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, please. As long as conservatives impose rather than promote or convince or educate, there can be no reconciliation and there can be no coming home. And we need conservatives, not to conserve for the sake of conserving, but conserving the good things about the American Republic. At the same time, libertarians have to remember virtue and civic engagement. And this leads us to, we could have a longer, more general discussion of um, social engineering and civil society, but I wanna talk about marriage culture. And I wanna talk about the importance of marriage. And I wanna talk about uh, my client's agreement with my uh, friend and advocate, um, Professor Schleter, that a marriage culture is important. Now I have to confess, I myself have been married to books all these years. So I would be remiss in front of an audience of conservative and libertarian lawyers to say that if there are any young ladies of good character out there who are interested in conversations about the evolution of common law, political philosophy and the constitution, please reach out to me. We can have a conversation at least about that. On a more serious note, just as marriage is important, here is where the troubling part about the conservative proposal comes in. The ending of no-fault divorce or the idea that the state can make things better. Let's look at poverty in the US. In the mid 1960s, the poverty rates had already been falling significantly since the end of World War II. In fact, poverty rates have stayed about flat since the mid 1960s and uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. The average poor person in the US, uh, well, it cost about $25,000 to support one poor person in the US and yet poverty remains. Certainly not all that money goes to the poor person who needs help. A lot of it goes to the care and feeding of the bureaucracy. There has been no real change since 1965. And today there are 89 federal programs. We can set aside the state programs, 89 federal programs and 12 or 13 agencies. I haven't checked the data in a week, so it's probably changed. Uh, 12 or 13 federal agencies that manage the war on poverty, which has failed. So I look at conservatism and I say, yes, this country needs a marriage culture. Yes, it is important at that kitchen table to have strong families. But are we really proposing a federal program whereby in 50 years there is the significant possibility that there would be absolutely no rate, no change in the rate of marriages, 89 different federal programs in support of marriage, $25,000 in support per married person, including the bureaucracy that handles the advancing of marriage and perhaps a dozen agencies. Now we can see in this reductio ad absurdum, the problem with conservatism. Conservatism has a tendency to identify very real problems and then step in and say, well, let's have our own form of social engineering. And honestly, I don't think it's, um, it's um, no fault divorce that has killed the family or that has harmed the family in the US, it's the expansion of the welfare state and the perverse incentives and the raft of federal incentives that guide people away from what we might call virtuous behavior. And instead of trying to replace one kind of social engineering with another kind of social engineering as conservatism would propose, libertarianism proposed to, proposes to leave such things to civil society and let the federal government in the form of its court enforce contracts amongst uh, consenting adults and not try to engineer and change society. I've pointed out the example of poverty. I've pointed out the example of marriage. The same applies for healthcare. Even before the Patient uh, Protection Act, 
in Affordable Care Act, 50 to 80% of government of health expenditures were already covered by the government. It's a problem, but government has what I would like to call the reverse Midas touch when it touches things. Let's be honest about what the government is and what the government does. Let's end the war on drugs. Let's end social engineering. And instead, let us propose a positive agenda, not a utopia, certainly not a utopia because libertarianism is very aware, pardon me, very aware of the limitations of human beings. So let's take away power from them. Let's let them experiment and talk and learn from each other in civil society and families, as opposed to imposing one set of visions through a government process that is fundamentally, fundamentally flawed. Uh, Professor Schleter, again, we're moving from what are the challenges and, uh, and is reconciliation possible? Great, so uh, reconciliation, I wanna just uh, affirm what uh, Dr. Wenzel began with, which was the two greatest threats are the administrative state and uh, the threats from you know, the uh, identity politics cancel culture. And I said amen to that. Uh, we are in full agreement. So, hey, there is hope here for reconciliation. We need to join forces on this because uh, uh, we're both going to get crushed if we're not uh, unified in, uh, against this. The question is how? What, what, uh, you know, how are we going to resist this? How, how are you going to get an effective um, resistance to this? And I, I think that simply the rhetoric of, of uh, all coercion is evil and all government is evil and we should just eliminate it all is not really going to be a very effective or persuasive policy or, or proposal for most Americans. Instead, uh, you know, you look at what the millennials seem to be attracted to the most, uh, what, what seems to be important to them uh, is some notion of, you know, of community, of care, of compassion for others. And I think we can affirm that, not, not the strategies they have, but I think you, whatever strategy you're going to have to attack the administrative state, it's going to have to be um, it's going to have to appeal even better to uh, a sensibility about our embodiment and our need for community and association. So I think uh, I'd be a, a fan of sort of a communitarian libertarianism. I think that would be a, a great thing. What I'm saying is we need a positive vision for social order, not just to get rid of government and then let the forces evolve as they will. So I would advocate something like what Hayek called the indirect method. Uh, Hayek supported museums, roads, um, uh, uh, systems of weights and measures, education, government involvement in education. All, even in his last book, he was advocating these, but he said, uh, government should not be providing these itself. It should be, um, you know, it should plan for competition. It should ensure that these things are provided, but it should provide them in such a way that, uh, that it uses the forces uh, within civil society to provide them. And so there are examples of this that I think are great. Like uh, I remember in high school reading a pamphlet by the Cato Institute uh, advocating uh, pri uh, privatizing social security into uh, private retirement accounts, just moving it over. There would still be coercion. You know, go government would still be taking the money out of your check for social security, but uh, you would have an option to invest it. And I remember reading that and, and really thinking that that's a great argument. I'm still persuaded by it, uh, by the argument. I, I, I'm disappointed that it, it failed, fizzled out. And when George Bush was promoting it in 2000, uh, it kind of fizzled out in part because of the Iraq war, kind of took everything else over. But I was a big fan of the ownership society, positive vision. Um, I am not an advocate of uh, the welfare state. And I think what you're saying is true about the perverse effects of the welfare state. So we agree on that. Um, but this is what I wanna say. Every, uh, there is a strong consensus within the social sciences that the almost the, the strongest correlation you can find to human flourishing in terms of education, employment, um, mental health, drug use, 
uh, vulnerability to abuse, whatever, just about the strongest correlation across that spectrum is whether you've been raised in the intact biological family. And what I mean by that is by your married mother and father, mother and father biological. It's the gold standard. You can look at the, the documentation that's coming out of the University of Virginia and the Marriage Project, where they've collected all that data and published it uh, in, in three, three editions, Why Marriage Matters. It turns out even cohabitation isn't a substitute. Okay, I'm going on a little too long here. I'll be quiet, except that I, I you know, it's gotta be that vision of the family. It can't just be, um, we, we've gotta put children first. Uh, as Katie Faust puts it, and she's got a new book coming out called Them Before Us. That, that conservatism has to be, can't be built, built on a culture of us before them, of thinking about laws which simply protect our individuality. We've got to also think about the, the institutions that, that are optimal for the kind of future people we're going to be living with, marrying, uh, associating with, and hopefully supporting liberty. So I do think that the, the, the breakdown of marriage um, is not the fault simply of libertarianism. I think conservatives actually are a lot to blame. I think no fault divorce clearly is associated, is directly correlated uh, with a decline, an escalation in divorce rates, a steep escalation in divorce rates. Those have leveled off recently, even come down a bit, but they're still there. No fault divorce is the only kind of contract in America that doesn't have fault built into the contract. A lot of people have pointed out it's anti-woman, it's anti-mother uh, who has often been the homemaker and raised kids. And now she, her husband leaves her no fault and she loses uh, the ability to claim fault and benefit from that, um, at least claim a just resolution to that kind of arrangement. So we can talk more about that. Uh, but I guess I would say uh, simply that I see a lot of possibility for reconciliation here if we can work together for um, you know, mitigating these problems, not asking for absolute no coercion in every case, but accepting things that are short of that, like uh, privatization of social security or other things. So uh, for the sake of opening up the conversation to the audience, I'll, I'll uh, end there. Well, and, and thank you both. Um, and I know we're obviously we're getting late, but I just want to turn this over to the audience. If you have any questions, please raise your hands. Um, I want to start with uh, Isaiah McKinney. Uh, you well, need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Gentlemen, thank you. This was, this was incredible. And Professor Wenzel, I hope you get somebody who takes you up on your offer and reaches out to you. Um, thank you. Um, so I have, I, have, I have three questions. I have one question for both of you and then one question, question specifically for individually for you, uh, each of you. So for both of you, I, the last topic was about the idea of reconciliation between libertarianism and conservatism. Do you think reconciliation is actually necessary or do conservatism and libertarianism both thrive best when they are independent, independent allies against the fight uh, in, in the fight against government expansion like do they need to come together and join do they need to come together or do they work best side by side um so that's my first question and then professor wenzel what would be your response to the concern concern that a libertarian a libertarian uh, society could lead towards lawlessness and immorality um, and Professor Fluter, what would you say to the response that if we give government the power to, if we, if we give government the power to legislate certain moral decisions, where, where, where does it stop? Thank you. I'm sorry, I know I asked a lot. Uh, Shall I start to compress the two? Who wants to take it first? Go ahead, Nikolai. He, he addressed you first. I'll start with the, the first comment. That's a very interesting question. It really depends in the arena of politics versus ideology. I think ideology, the two, um, libertarianism and conservatism, can complete each other and be completely independent and spar with each other and write books. And then in the political realm, 
to the extent that libertarians are willing to enter politics, I think it would be interesting to have that kind of um, alliance where both are comfortable to fight some of the greatest threats that we're facing today. Uh, in terms of the libertarian society, uh, if a libertarian society works the way it says it's going to work, you have a government that is protecting individual rights, so you don't have lawlessness. Then the second thing is immorality. That's certainly a big question, so I'm just going to answer it as uh, quickly as possible. Immorality is always possible. The question is, what is the best forum for guiding people towards the right kinds of decisions, at least that are better for, better to, for them to better themselves, to treat other people better, and to common, towards the common good and human flourishing? I argue that, that that is the civil society versus government. Is it going to be perfect? No we're operating with imperfect people. But is it going to be better than the coercion of government and the imposition of one size fits all visions? Certainly it's going to be better. Okay, uh, so Isaac, thank you for your questions. Uh, briefly on the reconciliation question, I'm trying to imagine uh, what this would look like. And uh, it seems to me that, um, if the libertarianism is of a pragmatic kind, um, then there's a ton of room. You know, when it's just like we're evaluating, comparing institutions and asking which one is most likely to promote flourishing and deal with the, what I call the knowledge problem and incentive problems. Uh, I think every conservative should be able to look at that and the arguments would favor something like a libertarian result almost every time. Yes, I just said that. Like when you are looking, you know, uh, it's clear, you know, I could give examples of the school, you know, just in my own community of the schools and other associations where the parents are involved and they're providing, they're teaching, they're, they're forming clubs and groups and the kids are getting involved. That's, that, that's where the flourishing happens. So uh, when someone doesn't start with a sort of abstract rule, no coercion period, uh, and then sort of doubles down on it, but says, let's just talk about uh, what arrangement is best gonna achieve this goal. Then I think you've got a lot of room to grow. I do think that um, libertarians need to call, stop calling social conservatives fascists and totalitarians. And I, I dare say, and I'll do respect to my adversary, social engineers. I don't think that's an accurate description of what so, uh, conservatives believe. On the other hand, conservatives, I think need to be a little friendlier to libertarians, as I've said, you know, the, the, the language has to change um, a little bit. Um, finally, I would say that, uh, where does it stop, you asked? You said, if, if government is given the power, uh, where does it stop? And I will only tell you that that is a great question and there is no answer except to constantly win out in every generation and fight for limited government. We don't have any choice. Politics is messy. It's with us. Uh, it would be great if we could just, you know, put some little device there to manage as a technique all our affairs, and then we wouldn't have to worry. But all every classical liberal knew that uh, this was a messy thing. You've got to get in, make your reasons, make your arguments. It's got to be defended. And uh, the, the, the argument, the slippery slope argument, if you're suggesting that, you start down with, with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, moral, moral regulation, you're going to uh, end up X. Um, I, I think it's a real objection, but it has to be balanced against, okay, we stay out of this and there's a great moral cost there too. Someone's gonna be harmed in that. So it's not neutral. And uh, so we have to work that out in the process. And I know that may not be a satisfactory answer, but conservatism doesn't promise uh, a, math, you know, a mathematical algorithm to make society work. It's a messy process. We have to get in and take it on the on on a sort of circumstantial basis. Privilege in civil society, as I said. Uh, thank you both for that, and thank you for that great question or those great questions. Um, let me uh, now turn to Audrey Redford. Audrey, you need to unmute. There you go. Hi. Thank you so much for the opportunity to to watch this. Um, I have a quick question, um, and I'm curious, since uh, Dr. Schluter, you described the relationship between uh, libertarianism and conservatism as one of the family, with perhaps libertarians uh, being the prodigal son and conservatism as the father. 
And then Professor Wenzel, you described it as more of a situation amongst old friends. And I'm curious, um, since both of you agree about the existence of a role of government, but perhaps with libertarianism, significantly more uh, minarchistic, uh, to use Professor Schluter's words, or more limited, as Professor Wenzel said, where in this relationship, and perhaps if any, would the anarchists, specifically anarcho-capitalists fit in? Would they be the wayward cousin or the friend that you perhaps gave up on back in your college years? But I was just wondering if either of you uh, could speak to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Audrey, I love your question. Uh, since Nikolai went first last time, I'll just jump in. Uh, I love that question. Um, I, I, when I teach social political philosophy, we read, we read Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State Utopia. And I love the last chapter of that book to me is, I love it. And I think it's underappreciated. It's called the framework for utopias. And he tries to offer a kind of account of an arc, uh, you know, it's, it is really libertarian. Like I think Nozick would like to be an anarcho-capitalist, but, uh, but you know what, the, the thing is that Nozick is aware in that last chapter that people really are motivated by living a flourishing life and they're, and they're pursuing that and, and this is sort of built into them. And so um, an ideal of government would be kind of some kind of framework in which people could associate uh, according to the diversity of great goods. And by the way, I wanna make very clear uh, that conservatism has always acknowledged that not just one, you know, it's a kind of a caricature that, that you know, conservatives think government should just like make people happy and virtuous according to one good. No conservative, I, I guess maybe Aristotle argued something like that, um, uh, but most of the conservatives that I uh, am promoting don't think that. They see that there are diversity of goods, friendship and knowledge and play and religion. And there are infinite ways people could participate in those goods. So a free society is gonna be, is gonna be diverse and robust. And I love that idea of a framework you know, for, these, for utopias is thinking about a good government. Um, I, I think anarcho-capitalism is a great thought experiment. It has certain attractions in it to me, I'll be honest. Um, but I think it also shows why libertarianism is actually incoherent because libertarianism wants to split the difference between anarchism on the one hand and classical liberalism on the other. But as I said earlier, as soon as you allow for uh, government to have a monopoly on coercion, it's already coerced to get there against people's wills. Unless people unanimously consented to be coerced, uh, it's already violated that. So if you start with a non-coercion principle, that Dr. Wenzel started with, you have to be an anarcho-capitalist to be consistent. And if you're not gonna be an anarcho-capitalist, then you've got to explain why you think uh, monopoly on coercion is okay, but nothing else is. And then you can start working it your other way. Last point I'll make is that I think it's very significant to point out that there was, there has, the very first defender of anarchism is in the 19th century. Like, I think that's the earliest instance we have of it. And libertarianism, it's the same thing. Libertarianism is closely associated with anarchism and they're both coming out of sort of utopian, French rationalist, socialist uh, movements and orders. They're not coming out of classical liberalism. So libertarianism has some, uh, to some degree, some suspicious uh, bedfellows, at least historically. Professor Wenzel. Well, my answer to that is it's a really difficult one. And to a large extent, it depends on whether you read Hayek before Rothbard or Rothbard before Hayek, because they're both so convincing. I find myself stuck on anarcho-capitalism because it really depends on whether I'm going, I probably shouldn't gesticulate with the, the, the uh, artificial background here, but whether one goes down or one goes up. If you start with an examination of government intervention in the economy, Government provision of food and housing leads to starvation and homelessness. It's a disaster. We know that. We've seen it from communism. Well, the same economic rules apply to food and housing as apply to, say, education. Education has been a failure when government gets involved in it for the same kinds of reasons, knowledge problems and public choice problems. 
So we can dismiss government provision about classical liberal goods and public goods and market failure. And if we can dismiss education, then why not dismiss also uh, security and courts? And then we're left with anarcho-capitalism. But if we start with the other way around, you look at anarcho-capitalism and you think, okay, well, why can't markets and civil society provide protection, provide police, provide even the military? Rothbard and others have made great cases for this, but then you wonder, okay, what if there's a dominant protection agency? Maybe we're better off having um, neutral judges and uh, neutral police forces. Ah, but if we start thinking in those terms, is there not an argument with John Stuart Mill for investing in some of the things, perhaps orphanages, perhaps some limited form of welfare that is going to make it cheaper to police and use the courts rather than just relying on the minarchist position. So I find myself honestly, and I was just talking about this last night with a co-author, stuck somewhere between classical liberalism and anarcho-capitalism. I think they're both magnificent thought experiments. And um, I think even within anarcho-capitalism, uh, there would be room for some sort of an emergence of a common law, and you certainly would need private arbitrators. I find myself really landing on minarchy for that reason. Both are tempting, both are good thought exercises. And the question is, both philosophically and empirically, how are we best going to advance individual rights and liberty? Well, thank you both. And I thank the audience for some very thoughtful and thought provoking questions. Um, and now it is time to, to wrap up this evening's event. Um, let me start by uh, thanking Professor Schleter and Professor Winsel uh, for joining me tonight. Uh, this, it's been great getting to know you and to uh, having the opportunity to start reading the book and talking with you. Um, I also want to stop, uh, thank the Federal Society Student Division and uh, the Pepperdine Student Chapter for organizing this event and asking me to serve as tonight's mediator. Uh, and uh, so thank you both and thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. There will not be a FETI fight night in March because we have the student symposium, which you can register for now on fedsoc.org. And thank you all again. Hope to see you in March.